mental toughness is not just mental. It's mental, it's emotional, it's physical, and it's spiritual. And the whole issue of health is the centerpiece of the whole thing. The healthier you are as a person in all dimensions, the better competitor you will be. So I didn't have it 100% right in the beginning. I just did the best I could. But we have a much better understanding of the things that actually make a difference in the lives of people as they grow older. And my biggest issue is let's make the tennis experience not just about winning, but about winning with character, winning in a way that actually helps you and all those around you be better, stronger human beings. And mental health is the centerpiece of that whole um, dynamic. This is Holding Court with Patrick McEnroe. All right, welcome to another edition of Holding Court, everyone. As you know, season four, we're focusing quite a bit on mental health, mental well-being, not just in the tennis world or sports world, but in the world in general. And trust me when I tell you this, everyone, there is no better person to have on to discuss where we are, where we've been, where are we going in this uh, in this department of our lives, of everyone's lives, than the great Dr. Jim Lair. Jim uh, was talking about this way before anybody else was talking about it years and years ago. When I first started out in the professional tennis tour, let's see, I'm 56, so that's going to be 30-some years ago. Uh, Dr. Lair, I appreciate you've been on before, but it's always good to catch up with you again, and especially as this season I'm doing a lot of focus on mental health. How are you? And I appreciate you coming back on Holding Court. Thank you so much, Patrick. I am delighted to be with you and delighted to talk about this new uh, kind of awareness of this area of mental health. As you, as you said, it's been a kind of a passion of mine for a long time, but it's really exciting what's happening now. I think we're really bringing it to the forefront and rightly so. And uh, so I really appreciate uh, the work you're doing on this and uh, hope we can move the ball forward on on this, you know, communication we're having now. Yeah, let's let, let, I want to start sort of at the beginning for you, Jim, because as I said, you were at the forefront of this. And interesting, as I was going back, all the books you've written and there's 18, there's a new one out just recently as well, which we'll get into. Um, it was mental toughness. That was sort of the big phrase. I remember you were one of the first people in our world, the tennis world, to talk about it. Um, how did that come about for you uh, and specifically how it related to the tennis world when you first got started? What, what, the first book you wrote was what year? What did it come out? Um, in 1979, and then it was re issued in 1982, it was a mental toughness training for sport. And that was, it was rejected by 19 publishers because they didn't know what the word mental toughness actually meant. It made no sense. And then my father said, you know, he was a professional baseball player. And uh, he said, it really makes sense to me. I'm going to publish 5,000 copies for you. And that was really hard for him because he really didn't have a whole lot of money. But um, it was kind of, you know, just distributed amongst various people. And it became an unbelievable phenom worldwide bestseller to kind of launch this whole thing about mental toughness. And, um, you know, I've, it's, it's been an evolutionary process for me. Um, mental toughness is not just mental. It's mental, it's emotional, it's physical, and it's spiritual. And the whole issue of health is the centerpiece of the whole thing. The healthier you are as a person in all dimensions, the better competitor you will be. So I didn't have it 100% right in the beginning. I just did the best I could. But we have a much better understanding of the things that actually make a difference in the lives of people as they grow older. And my biggest issue is let's make the tennis experience not just about winning, but about winning with character, winning in a way that actually helps you and all those around you be better, stronger human beings. And mental health is the centerpiece of that whole um, dynamic. So your dad was a baseball player. What sports did you play growing up, Jim? Oh, I played nine years of baseball. Mm -hmm. um, he was my coach. 
And um, he was, uh, you know, he got hurt in training camp and he couldn't pitch anymore, but he had a son who could pitch. And so every single day I would throw a million balls. <laughs> they didn't know at that time that you're not supposed to throw that many. I could throw sliders and curveballs and knuckleballs as an 11 year old. Wow. And, uh, and, um, uh, but I was pitching uh, at the age of 14 and, uh, my arm, I just threw my arm out. I've never been able to throw a ball since. Wow. And now we know they count the number of pitches right. that you play. So I, I was also a pretty good basketball player. And, uh, and I really, my father was also a tennis player. My mom was. And so I was able to play tennis and play basketball. But tennis is the sport that captured me in a way that nothing else has. And I've been had a love affair with tennis my whole life. And why did tennis capture you in a way that was different? You know, I, I don't I can't really explain it, but I've gotten I have 16 members of my family and I've given them the disease all across <laughs> the whole spectrum. And uh, they're all at addicts. My my youngest son played professional tennis, um, Jeff, and uh, it has been a, a crowning uh force in his life and all of my sons and all of I have seven grandkids wow. and they all play tennis and I've gotten a couple of the wives my daughter daughter-in-laws who didn't play they we go to all these events and they never played and so we we got them involved at a 2.5 level right and and they are now so addicted to tennis it's the most unbelievable thing. Uh, they're starting a kind of a national movement called Serving Tennis Women. The whole idea is to get people started in tennis because it's done such remarkable things for her and connected to her family. And it's it's something I'm very excited about. So she's uh, her husband. You know, she, she's lost weight. She's on fire. She's excited. She plays in all these leagues. Right. It's crazy. But it's so good for her, good for her family. And so we have tennis vacations. Now everyone can play. We just came back from Palm Springs and everyone plays tennis. We have a draw that everyone plays and they're all quite good. And it's quite remarkable how one, once you get something started like that, it is a multi-generational sport, very low risk of injury. And um, it's just so good for people to be involved in some kind of physical activity like that for a lifetime you know the usta's mission right dr lair to promote and grow the game of tennis maybe they should hire you exactly i know you've done a lot for them over the years of course with your with your mental health training but that's a, that's remarkable so when your uh your first book comes out i'm going to say you were like early 20s mid 20s at that point what was the yes I, yeah i was just i was involved in tennis but it was the early years yeah so the early years and what prompted you to write about mental toughness was it just because you love tennis so much as a sport or was it was it grander than that was it that was a way you could you felt you could connect well i people? felt you know i was i got a late start in tennis and but i wanted to i just fell in love with the sport but i wasn't that successful as a young competitor and i started looking for resources that would help me become a better stronger competitor Basketball, I was a very good competitor, but an individual sport like tennis was different. And I got nervous. I had all the issues there. I was got frustrated at a temper, all those things. And, you know, I just started to reflect on the kinds of things that I really, the person I wanted to be as a competitor. And at that time, there were a lot of great players. And, you know, even today, someone like Roger Federer or even Carlos um Alcaraz, Alcaraz, you yeah. know they have this just incredible you know kind of poise under stress uh, they can concentrate they were they're able to you know disconnect the law of disengagement um and just dis dis detachment so to speak it's remarkable and everywhere i go i try to you know talk about that because we really want to train the body to be able to deal with stress in a dynamic way to give your very best and to let it go, because if you don't let it go, you carry it into the next point. And I began to get that as a young player, and I started to become a much better competitor, and people wanted to know what I was doing, and then eventually I put it into writing, and it actually came out of my soul, because that's where I was 
the pain and kind of suffering that an athlete feels when they're not reaching their potential. And it kind of connected to, and I, then I did this research on the, what I call the ideal performance state. When you're performing at your best, what are you really feeling? And we, we, then we built a kind of a step-by-step -step program to try to get to that ideal place. And it really, for me, was the foundation of what I came to understand with competitive strength. You know, it's amazing because I was just, just in the past, I was on vacation last week with my family and somebody asked me while I was on vacation, uh, what, what was it about, how do you get into the zone? You know, and I know this is right. something. And the other thing, so I was just trying to explain to someone, I said, well, when you're in the zone, you know, you can't do anything wrong. You feel like you're playing. And right. we used to say as kids, you know, growing up playing junior tennis, like if someone was playing above their normal level, uh, he's zoning. You know, it became he's like zoning. a phrase. He's zoning. This guy's zoning. He's going to come out of this. <laughs> well, what, but but yeah, that's, exactly. that, that's a big part of what you're talking about, isn't it? Getting to that state, that relaxed well, that is, state. That was, that's the word that is currently used is zoning. Um, for me, it was the ideal performance. When you stepped into it, it's magical. And we've all been there. But you want to try to bring that as much as you can under voluntary control to be able to be at your best at the most critical times. And it is a learned skill. I've learned mm -hmm. that over the years. It's acquired. It's not something you're born with. You will occasionally pass through it accidentally, and you just light it up. And you go, what the world was that? That's how I want to play the rest of my life. And you try it the next day. And it's so mysterious. It's like some kind of visitation from the gods that you, <laughs> you're absolutely perfect. And then it goes away. And you wonder that you get very superstitious. You get almost crazy about what it is that brings that special state on. And what it really is, is a lot of hard work tuning into the kinds of being relaxed, being calm. It's physical. It's emotional. You have to eat properly. You have to get enough sleep. It's a very delicate chemistry. It's like we're all beakers of chem chemicals. And if we get them all right, you light it up. And the more you train in the right ways, the more likely this will occur when you're in that dynamic situation of stress. But most people get too nervous and the cortisol levels rise and the mix gets crazy. And you see it amongst even the very best players in the world. If they lose it a little bit, but they're much quicker to get it back. They may lose a few points. They may lose a set because they kind of started focusing too much on things that they can't control. They bring it back. They get back to the moment. They go back into that kind of that beaker of joy and, and, and really gratitude. And a sense I will never give up. When you watch Rafa play, he was always positive, always gave 100% effort. And those are the only things we can control as competitors. And if you get that and let it go, the next point has to be completely history. You can learn from it, then you move forward. And that was... Uh, those lessons come slowly, just like learning a great forehand or backhand, but people don't practice it because they're so confused by it. It seems like because they can't see it, it's almost like uh, a gift from the gods and they just don't get enough of it. I just want you to know, Dr. Lair, again, it's Dr. Jim Lair joining me, Patrick McEnroe here on Holding Court, that yesterday at the John McEnroe Tennis Academy, of course, which I'm there most days when I'm here back home in New York, we had in our mental performance coach. And one of the things, he was actually speaking uh, to our group of coaches, of which we've got about 36, 37 coaches, so a lot of people in our coaches' meeting. And then he goes around and roams around when the kids are, are practicing in their groups and so on. But what he said, and it made me think of you, because you, you were the first guy that talked about this, but he talked about resetting. You know, when something resetting. resetting and for, you know, I remember we, with you is, you know, look at the strings, you know, Sharapova. She used to look, you know, look at strings, exactly. turn around. So how did that start? Because I, you should feel good about this, Doc, because your <laughs> words are being spread. You know, this has become sort of the common um, common knowledge, really, amongst mental performance people. That's going to make you feel pretty good because you were the first guy that ever talked about that, that resetting. I feel, I feel very fortunate, uh, Patrick, to have had the opportunity. I was at the Nick Bolletieri Tennis Academy for six years. I was a director of sports science and director of sports psychology. And I had an institute that I could set up there. And I had 240 of the best players in the world 
right there in front of me every day. And I hooked him up with every kind of telemetry humanly possible. I, you know, I had Andre there and Jim Courier and David Wheaton and Martin Blackman right. and on and on. And uh, so one of the things I did was I videotaped them over and over and over again and then began to look at compared their videos with the very best players in terms of how they manage stress. I had uh, remote microphones on them, so they actually talked about verbally what they were thinking to themselves. And out of that came an understanding. Uh, most people had never thought about the between point time in tennis. It had never mm -hmm. been talked about. But it's as much as 70 or 80% of a match. And it made no sense to me that we don't train in that time. If a match is 75%, occurring when you're not actually hitting a ball, maybe that ought to be a training arena. So we started really looking at the between point time. And out of that came this remarkable kind of insight that there is a way to deal with the demands of the sport in a way that actually enhance IPS control or getting into the zone. So I developed this notion of the 16 second cure. And it was a video that was spread all over the world. And um, and now uh, we redid it and have all the best players in the world on it. It's it's free. I've given it free to everyone. You can get it by going gotta dot com. It's gotta tennis dot com. Okay. And you can get that free video um, on all the current players on that time between points and what they all do. And for me, I felt very very grateful to be in that environment. I could have never developed that understanding uh, without the opportunity I had at Knicks. Now, at our tennis academy, as, as I'm sure you are well aware, Jim, we run the gamut, right? We've got players that are top junior players that go on to play Division right. One tennis. We've got kids that are, you know, playing their high school team. So here's what I asked our mental performance coach in front of all the coaches yesterday. I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, what I hear the most when I'm walking around, particularly with maybe not the highest level kids, okay? And this is the majority of people playing tennis, so this is why I'm interested in this. Here's, here, here's two things I hear when I walk around. So obviously they know it's me. They, you know, maybe their stress level goes up because they see me coming on the court. <laughs> but here are two things that I hear a lot, and I want to know what you think is the best response for me or for coaches in general. I'm playing so bad today. This is, the, I, I, I'm, this is the worst. I'm having such a bad day. Okay, that's number one. The other one I hear a lot, particularly on a Monday or after a vacation, which was yet <laughs> this week, I haven't, they, as soon as they see me, they miss a shot, and they say, I haven't played for a while. Okay, so <laughs> what, would, what would you say are the responses for me as a coach, as a mentor, and for our, you know, a lot of our coaches are young players that are just off playing college tennis. They don't have a ton of experience. What would you advise us to do to help those kids the best we can? So I'd start with a question. I would just ask them this. Do you want to be an extraordinary player and competitor, or do you want to just be average or normal? And they're all going to say, I want to be extraordinary. And I say, well, you cannot be normal. What's normal is to throw a fit, to make excuses, to, uh, you know, really be disappointed in yourself and to show a lot of kind of frustration and anger because today is a bad day for you. The way in which you learn how to hold up under pressure is to take a day like today, which is a gift, and learn how to deal with it and show mm. the most positive, the most resilient. Show me the positive energy. If you can do this when you play badly, I know you can do it when you play well. What's normal is not going to get you where you want to go. And I doubt whether you want to put all the time and energy that you're putting in at this academy to be just average. You want to be extraordinary. So you can't, be in, you can't have a normal response. Just like a forehand, Alcarez's forehand is not normal. That's the most extraordinary thing. Look at all the great competitors. Federer, you know, you take on the men's or women's side. It's very abnormal what they do. You cannot be normal, which means you have to push the envelope every single day. And when you have a bad day, it is a gift to, to train yourself to deal with tough times in a way that will really reflect the ideal person you want to be as a competitor.
So it's not just for you. It's not just about the tennis, right? It's about who you want to be as a person. As a person for me, I mean, it's always the person first and the athlete second. I want to know what kind of human being you're becoming because of tennis. If you're becoming, you know, this entitled individual because you can hit a tennis ball better than everybody else and you just kind of walk around like you're king or queen of the island, I will tell you, doesn't impress me. I want to know, first of all, who you are as a person and I want to know how you treat other people on mm. the way to the top. And so I'm really looking at your ability to be gracious in defeat and humble in victory. I want to see you as a human being that everyone is proud of. I want you to be like Alcaraz, like, you know, uh, any of the great players, um, such as Federer or, you know, Swiatek. There's so, so many great men and women players who really draw you to them. And that's who we want to embody. It is possible, but it's not easy. The easy way is to show negative emotion, cuss and swear, just be yourself out there. But chances are that's going to cost you. And you don't really serve the game of tennis that well. Dr. Jim Lair, everyone, renowned sports psychologist and mental performance coach, and he's done it all. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll ask him how he thinks we're doing overall in the world of mental health here on Holding Court. North Organic CBD is our sponsor here on Holding Court. I love their CBD gummies. They come in two delicious flavors, strawberry lemonade and green apple. I take both. Both are amazing. One a day and you are totally okay. I love to stay active. I still play tennis regularly. I love to hike. I love to go to the gym. That's why I use North Organics CBD. Their products are made in the USA. They're high quality, broad spectrum organic CBD products for everyday adventures. And don't forget about the very popular CBD salve, immediate relief of any physical pain. I use it on my shoulder. Although I'm not serving quite as big as I used to, but you know what I mean. I use it daily for the shoulders, as I said, for the knees, for the hips, you name it. It works wonders. Go to NorthOrganicsCBD.com and enter Patrick20. That's Patrick20 for 20% off your order. All right, welcome back to Holding Court, everyone. Dr. Jim Lair joining me here. Fascinating conversation. Doc, when you look at where the world is, not just the tennis world. I mean, we know we've had Naomi Osaka put out there her mental health issues in the last couple of years. That was at the French Open. Of course, we hope she comes back. Uh, she'll be a mom when she comes back to the tour, which we hope will be uh, next year. How do you think we just as a, as a society are doing in the tennis world, of course, the professional realm, but also just in general? I mean, I see obviously in our world of tennis um, – what I call the over-professionalization of youth sports, which I think is happening, you know, not just in tennis, but in a lot of sports. So how do you think we're doing as a society overall balancing those pressures and being able to have more of these conversations about overall mental health? So it's a really interesting issue. When I started, when someone, uh, most people never wanted to say that they were working with a psychologist. And so I, it was very hard for me to actually put my feet into any kind of a career because athletes were ashamed to talk about it. It was almost like, even though it was in the area of mental toughness, it suggested you have an emotional or psychological weakness because psychology was about, you know, basically, you know, trying to fix things that were somehow not aligned properly mentally or emotionally. And, uh, but that whole era now has shifted. There's another whole kind of framework around positive psychology. And it really has, you know, I, I look at exercise physiology, you know, you look at almost all the sports, everyone has an exercise physiologist. And in the early years, no one had one. It was right. like, you know, you just, you just did your thing. You played your sport. But now everyone, now they have nutritionists. And now they have people that they can seek out from the mental and emotional side, just like you're at your academy. You have a mental performance coach and everyone sees them as part of the team. So it elevates this. It's not a weakness to seek help in this area. It actually is just another strength that will help you become a stronger person and a better competitor. 
So the visibility now that Naomi Osaka and Raducanu and, and so many of the players now, they're very open about this. I think it's absolutely terrific. And you're right. I don't think there's ever been more pressure. I had a conversation last night with a mother whose daughter just got into UCLA. And she is literally every second, she's a very high level competitor. She's competitive in everything. She has no time in her life, no space. There's no, not a lot of joy. It's all meeting these performance expectations. And her mother knows when she gets into UCLA, it's going to be nothing more but a complete line of additional pressures in sport as well as in her academics. And she asked me the question. She said, how do you ever prepare kids for this? Everything is like maximum effort. There's no time to just kind of smell the the roses and enjoy your life. And the kids begin to wonder, is this what life is all about? Will I ever have a time to sit back and kind of reflect on the kinds of things that I really want to do and, joy, and the joys in my life? And I thought it was a great question because that's what's happening. And so parents and coaches have to realize, I worked out this stress recovery relationship that where every dose of stress, you have to have an equivalent dose of recovery or you start to get closer to burning out and your ability to enter the zone and enter this special ideal performance state goes away. We've got to understand we are all oscillatory creatures in an oscillatory universe. And every biopotential in human physiology is oscillatory. Nothing is a straight line. It's all energy expenditure and energy recovery. And, if, and we have to do that physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. Spiritually meaning your deepest values, your beliefs, what you care about, um, your purpose in life, we have to replenish that. And if we don't get the right balance, people get out on the edge and they lose the joy in life. And a lot of kids just can't take it. Parents keep pushing. And unfortunately, they should be pushing for balance or some kind of, you know, sense of, of how, how all this comes together in life so that you have a great life and you can enjoy your life. And uh, so I'm always talking to parents about this issue. It's not just pushing, you know, for a long time, everyone thought whoever, for instance, in golf, whoever hit the most balls is going to be the best. And so they have their kids out there hitting millions of balls with bloody hands. Mm. I've witnessed it. I've been right next to them. And they just say, you have to gut, gut it out. And one day you will thank me for this. Mm. And I say, no, no one's going to thank you for this. What you're doing here is almost a form of child abuse. You've got it wired up wrong. So immediately I get fired because they don't want to hear that message. Right. And uh, But I, I've tried to be uh, on that wavelength for most of my career. And I'm very happy that the USTA and the Sports Science Committee um, is really understanding and really putting a lot of their intellectual knowledge in helping players find balance. The WTA has done a remarkable job in their player development uh, efforts to try to help protect players through this journey. And I have such great respect for all of them um, uh, that, that have, have worked so hard. They've made a huge contribution and they've affected all women's sports uh, because they have been they've been out in front leading the way on that. And I I have had great admiration for all the people on that uh, on that committee. It's been um, and that age elig age eligibility committee that has tried to protect these young players from the the in enormity of the pressure. And you see it when they finally win a great tournament or maybe out of the blue. All of a sudden, they go into a spiral mm. because the pressures are so great, and it's really hard to prepare a 19 or 20 year old for those pressures. You know, I was talking to Pam Shriver in one of my uh, season four podcasts as well, uh, Doc, and she's been very outspoken about her own issues when she was playing on the tour as a teenager. So she's really been pushing the WTA. She told me actually in the course of our conversation, which I was ecstatic to hear, that the WTA now has available to the players at every tournament on the WTA tour, a mental health expert that they can go to. hundred yeah. percent. And that has not been easy for them, but they've done it and I applaud them. 
Yeah. All right. I want to ask you about, um, before I let you go, you've been amazing. We could go on for hours. Uh, the, your new book, you've, it was your 18th book. And of course you've run the gamut between mental performance, <laughs> mental health, you know, working for uh, some big companies as you've done, you got into the corporate world. You started your own Institute, the human performance Institute, which you obviously ran for many years. Talk a little bit about your latest book. Cause you, you just never stop rolling doc. Well, I have to tell you, you know, I've been around a long time and an old guy. My my grandkids refer my kids refer to me as ancient ruins. <laughs> Hardly. So, uh, yeah. But I I'm always reflecting on what I've learned and what uh, all the roads led to the same place. And I looked at all the work I've done. Ultimately, I wish I had come to this early in my career. Ultimately, our lives are the result of the choices we make, the decisions that we make. Um, actually determine our destiny. And we have to really look at, in, in a single hour, we can, in, in a single day, let's just start there, we can make as many as 35,000 decisions. Mm. In, a, in a given week, 245,000 decisions. And in the course of one year, 1. 1.2 million decisions. The question I have is, what are you referencing? How are you making those decisions? A great um, brilliant uh, scientist by the name of Daniel Kahneman wrote a book, a best-selling book called Thinking Fast and Think Thinking Slow. And what he did was he, he helped us understand how this neural processor between our ears operates in two ways, fast and slow. Most of the decisions we make are made quickly. We don't think about them. But the big decisions that are most important are, are those that need to be very, very carefully vetted. I developed this notion along with my co-author, Dr. Sheila Walker Olson, who has her PhD in, in behavioral genetics, brilliant, brilliant scientist. And we came to understand that we all have inside of us uh, our own personal advisor. And we came to call it Yoda, your own decision advisor. Mm. And that decision advisor has to be kind of trained to make the best decisions at the right time. We don't teach... Parents don't know how to teach decision-making. They don't teach it in grade school or elementary school. They don't teach it in high school. They don't teach it in college. They don't teach it in business schools for the most part. And it's the most important competency we have as human beings. And so we did a science-based approach to digging all the information that we know about making good decisions and applying it to you know parents, teachers, coaches, actually applying it actually in sport Sport is a wonderful way. Tennis, how many decisions you have to make mm. on the court constantly. Shall I stay engaged? Shall I show, you know, making a, uh, a bad line call? Um, and what, how should you uh, respond to being cheated? There are, you know, countless decisions. Should I go cross court? Shall I come in? Shall I stay back? Do I need to be more patient? That decision-making process in tennis can be extrapolated into all kinds of positive learnings in life. And so the book is about the importance of decision making and how do we become better, better, we make better choices in our lives based on all the science that's out there. It's, I think it's probably the most important book I've ever written. Well, that says something because you've written a lot of important ones and you've given so much to uh, this world, Dr. Lair, and to the, obviously to the tennis world. We know that particularly. I always feel like I learned something when I talk to you because I do. And uh, thank you so much for coming back on Holding Court. All the best to you. Uh, good luck in your next family tournament, because I'm sure you've got a few <laughs> tricks up those ancient ruined sleeves of yours. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, Patrick. I, it's always a joy to connect with you. Thank you for all the contributions you've made to the sport of tennis is remarkable. I mean, you are one of the great voices of wisdom in my judgment. You have a great Yoda. You make great decisions <laughs> as far as uh, what, what's the best way to really have an impact. Both you and your brother have done a remarkable job and it's, a, it's an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. One of the decisions I made was to join the International Tennis Hall of Fame. So I'm on my way up there in the next day to uh, visit some of uh, uh, the, the staff there in Newport. So I'm looking forward to that new challenge. Oh, and, fantastic. Uh, yeah, fantastic. I'm really excited about it. And thank you again for all you've done. By the way, go to jimlair.com. That's L-O-E-H-R. 
jim-laird.com. You can see all the information on what Jim's done, all his books. That's jim-laird.com. Jim-laird.com. Uh, and yeah. Amazon, of course, has all his books over many years of service uh, to the world. So thank you so much, Doc. Thank you so much, Patrick. Dr. Jim Lair, everyone, on Holding Court. Holding Court is powered by Mudhouse Media.